Now, no one here needs an introduction to Bob Schieffer and to Henry Kissinger. Uh, you know Bob, uh, the quintessential uh, media journalist of, in Washington. More than anything, he asks the simplest questions and the hardest questions simultaneously, which is really a mark of ultra-professionalism. Bob, we'll turn it to you to run this, this whole program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And it's uh, really fun to be here and uh, to have this uh, association uh, with uh, with CS, CSIS, and it's always fun uh, to interview uh, Dr. Kissinger, which I've been doing since back in the, uh, I didn't get to talk to him during the uh, Nixon administration, but I talked to him a lot during the Ford uh, administration, and uh, sometimes he liked my questions and sometimes he didn't, but we've been uh, friends all along the way, and uh, I have, there's no one in American life today that, that I have more respect for than Dr. Kissinger. So that doesn't mean I'm going to ask you easy questions here today. So. Doctor, uh, I, I do. I kind of am known for asking the obvious questions. So everybody's been talking about you. We've been talking about uh, U.S.-China relations today. I, I want to ask you the obvious question. How do you uh, assess U.S.-Chinese relations right now, today? today? Both of our countries are undergoing potential changes. Uh, we have to face we have to face the fact that our relative position in the world is going to diminish in the sense that we're not going to be the dominant nation, but we're still going to be an extremely powerful nation. Chinese have a change of leadership coming up. And they will have to face during that period how to bring their political arrangements in line with their economic achievements. So both sides will have a temptation to use nationalistic explanations for the difficulties associated with that process. Uh, we can blame our economic crises on the Chinese, but we have to distinguish those things that are caused by our own failures from those that may be caused by the actions of others. The Chinese have to adjust, as was said in previous panels, to an international environment in which for the first time in their history, they have to deal with an international system composed of at least some states of, uh, of equal magnitude. So uh, I think the Chinese in the last year have gone through a process in which first feeling the uh, impact of the economic crisis and feeling the confidence that that inspired in them relative to us of the, Attempt of, of, of testing their power. And I think they're coming to the point of view that they need a substantial period of coexistence. We in this country, as far as the administration is concerned, I believe has also come to this view. But the internal debate about the ideological conflict with, the, with China is growing rather, uh, rather than diminishing. I don't know where we will be at the end of, say, 10, 15 years. But I believe that if we make a serious effort to deal with the unique aspect of the situation that we have two major powers, one of which is sort, it's rising, uh, but two major powers who know the consequences of a conflict between them. Uh, and. Uh, being at least prepared to take a look at what measures can be taken to alleviate these dangers, that then at the end of that period, cooperation of some kind may have become habit forming. That is my objective, objective we should. Uh, uh, one of the uh, goals in this book for you is to 
help Americans understand China's strategic thinking. What exactly do you mean by that? And help us understand. In American history, in the American experience, every problem that we have recognized as a problem has proved sol soluble. So we tend to segment. Has proved what? Has proved soluble. Soluble. I okay. So we could. Uh, or we could overwhelm it with resources. And it has had a finite time limit that you could attach to it. In Chinese history, no problem has an ultimate solution in Chinese perception. Every solution is an admissions ticket for another set of pro uh, uh, problems. <coughs> We tend to think that there is one interpretation of, uh, uh, of a situation. The Chinese tend to see the situation in a more complex way with various aspects. Let me give one example that struck me as I was actually writing in this book, which is the different notions of deterrence, as I understand it. America, the American approach to deterrence is you identify the danger, you amass resources, and if the danger becomes acute, you overwhelm it. So you, it is addressed to capability. The Chinese approach is also to identify the danger, but then to deal with the psychological capability of implementing it. So the Chinese are more apt to take a preemptive military action, but it would be of a much more limited nature. For example, the war with India in 62, the war with Vietnam in 79, both were designed to affect the calculations of the adversary not to achieve a, vic a total victory. In fact, they achieved whatever military goal they set and then abandoned it because they were more concerned with the psychological impact. Uh, and before that, there's been some discussion of the difference between the, the game of chess and the game of, uh, of Go. So this would be the difference in, uh, in approach. You talk a lot about, about China's great goal is to avoid, to avoid encirclement. Uh, is that sort of the basis of their foreign policy uh, as you go back through history? Well, uh, somebody when we were standing around said to me that my book is, is being reviewed widely by Sinophiles, by, by experts, of, uh, by Sinologists. Uh, I don't consider myself a Chinese scholar. I consider myself somebody who has had a lot of experience with Chinese leaders and who has thought a lot about how they evolved their thinking. Now, the idea of encirclement arose in my mind when I wrote this book. I asked the question, why did the Chinese intervene in the Korean War? And I tried to trace what it was that made the Chinese take their decision. And like most American intellectuals, I used to think that it was the advance of the Yalu River that was the decisive element, and that that was an example of American rashness uh, that triggered an in, an, a Chinese reaction. But that isn't what happened when, when you study it. What happened was that, the, uh, that when, uh, uh, when, we, when the North Koreans invaded the South, 
and Truman unexpectedly for the Chinese and Russians responded by sending troops to South Korea and then followed this up by what Truman thought was a conciliatory move, namely moving the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Straits and saying he was keeping both sides from attacking, the Chinese, Taiwan, and Taiwan, the mainland. In the Chinese mind, this meant that America had re-entered the Civil War, and it was, had put a uh, market down in the Straits, and it had put another market down in Korea, and it would, as they said in their internal discussions, put another market into Vietnam. And if they didn't give us a shocking response, uh, we would keep that process going. And uh, the planning for the invasion, or whatever you call it, of, of Korea, started within a week of our uh, fleet in, in the Straits and of our troops while we were still in the Putan, in the Putan perimeter. The implementation then uh, was probably speeded up by moving up to the Yalu, but even then I'm not 100% uh, sure. And uh, the same was true in Vietnam in 1979. They had been allies of Vietnam until 1975. And then uh, almost immediately they fell out with uh, with Vietnam because they interpreted Vietnamese moves in Cambodia and Laos as a prelude to taking over all of North, uh, Southeast Asia. And then when uh, Vietnam made an alliance with the Soviet Union, uh, they decided to strike. And this is a good example of this preemptive deterrence that I'm talking about. Most Western nations would say that when Vietnam made an alliance with the Soviet Union. It had become impregnable. Here was the Soviet Union to the north. And, uh, but within a month, uh, the uh, Chinese attacked Vietnam with as much of an eye on the Soviet Union as on Vietnam. Uh, and one could argue, although it wasn't recognized as such, that the decline of the Soviet Union as a superpower began when they acquiesced in the attack on, a, on an ally that they had just recently made and permitted the northern provinces to be totally uh, uh, devastated and then uh, withdraw. The Chinese paid a horrendous price for it. And in most of the uh, Western military lit literature, this is described as a Chinese defeat. But if you look at it in strategic terms, it was from the point of view of what I, would, what I call in the book offensive deterrence, it was successful. Speaking of Vietnam, in uh, what you just said, what, what does that mean to how we react to uh, China's uh, assertive actions in the South China Sea. I mean, is there a danger that we might back China into a corner here? Well, uh, I must say, during the Vietnam War, I mean, it's not your question, but mm -hmm. I, I think one has to say this. We did not, as a country, adequately analyze uh, the uh, impact the relationship of China and Vietnam. A succession of American administrations believed that Vietnam was an extension of Chinese policy and that it was all part of a grand strategy in which Moscow, Beijing, and Hanoi uh, were working together and nothing could have been, uh, could have been uh, further from the truth. So. Uh, in the nature of things, Vietnam and China are strategic opponents in the sense that Vietnam is assertive, uh, 
uh, insisting on its uh, uh, autonomy. Uh, we, of course, have an interest uh, in the independence of the countries of Southeast Asia. But we should not treat Vietnam as if it were an ally against China. And while I agreed with what was said about freedom of seas in, in the Southeast, uh, South China Sea, I did not think Hanoi was the ideal place to make that uh, declaration. Uh, and we should avoid, uh, we should find political and economic means of cooperating with the countries of South Asia. We should avoid the impression of a military containment policy. Uh, and China should accept our having these relationships without trying uh, to push us out of Asia. Those are the two limits. No containment, no Chinese hegem hegemony over all of Asia. But, but are you saying that, that some of this, some of what we're seeing in that area today goes back uh, to, to the Vietnam War? And, and no, uh, no, I don't think it goes back to the Vietnam War. It's such, yeah. uh, it is, people say that the conventional w wisdom is to say, China is a rising power, we are an established power, it's a rising power, uh, usually in conflict with established powers, and therefore it's like Germany and Britain. In a way that's true, but in a way China does not think of itself as a rising power. China thinks of itself as a country that was preeminent for 1800 of the last 2000 years, and is returning to its traditional preeminence. In its traditional preeminence, the states surrounding it were treated as a kind, of, were treated as tributary states. And indeed, the notion of sovereign states did not exist. Vietnam had actually been a part of the Chinese Empire, so that relationship is, is particularly tense. It's, if I look back on the Vietnam War, something I did not fully understand at the time was the Chinese strategic interest in Vietnam was really the same as ours. They would have liked to see an outcome of force at stake uh, from a strategic point of view, but from a, but they didn't want an American strategic presence there. Uh, having, uh, but once we were withdrawn from Vietnam, some of the traditional Chinese notions of how surrounding states should behave uh, reemerged. But I, I read today that uh, the Chinese defense minister in Singapore said that the issue of freedom of the seas is not the issue. And if that is true, then we are dealing with a whole set of complicated, abstruse uh, issues having to do with economic uh, economic zones around some rocks, in some cases. There, there are some islands there that are islands only at low tide. On one of them, in fact, the Chinese have built a platform so <laughs> that it's always... <laughs> uh, my, my point is, uh, the South China Sea issue, we, we will defend freedom of the seas. We cannot abandon that. I think this is one of those issues where the Chinese will come, uh, where we and the Chinese will come to an understanding, and in which I believe they have already modified their attitude of last year. Then there'll be a whole set of uh, issues about these uh, these various islands and 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 that will involve the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Indonesia, and that will be a very complicated uh, uh, diplomacy. Uh, 
but I don't think it will threaten the peace of the world. Do you, uh, do you think that China's uh, strategic approach will change as their stature in the world changes? I mean, you, you say they don't see themselves as a rising power. They see themselves returning to their the place where they, they once were. But they recognize that, that there's change here. And will that change their approach to these things? Well, this is one of those questions which I meant in my early remark that will have to evolve over the next 15 years. Uh, I, w I think the natural instinct of the Chinese with respect to surrounding countries, it's, it will take an effort to get to treat them as fully equal sovereign countries. Uh, they, can, they know the language of doing it. Uh, I think it will happen, and I think it is probably happening now, but the basic question is as their power grows, uh, my interpretation of their thinking is they will want to be treated with respect. And respect will be related to their strength. So if we keep going down internally and they keep going up, uh, our negotiating position will be much more difficult for any observer of China. The financial crisis of 2007 had more to do with our political difficulties than the actual issues that arose. The Chinese had believed that the American knew how to run the global financial system. And they had actually geared a lot of their policies to that belief. So when it became apparent that we didn't know it, not only did we lose faith, if one can use that word, but also the people that had been associated with the policy of cooperating with the United States lost uh, some uh, of their prestige. So we cannot ask the Chinese to solve our own domestic problems for us. We have to distinguish those things they do that are remediable by decisive American or, or long-range American policy, and those a, pro a foreign policy, and those which we need to deal with by making ourselves truly competitive. That second part, we cannot ask for them to solve for us. What does it do to the relationship that we borrow so much from the Chinese? Has that changed the relationship? You seem to kind of suggest that perhaps it might have. Well, because the, we way it was, the way it was until about 10 years ago, I don't think it was damn, it was even in a way helpful to the relationship. But when a nation keeps borrowing in a profligate way uh, and heads itself for a demonstrable financial crisis, then uh, it, uh, it, it means you are tying yourself to a potential wreck. It isn't that they can use what the money we owe them in a strategic way because we can then cut off their exports and it's sort of a, a mutual suicide uh, uh, pact. Uh, but it does not enhance our capacity to, con to convince them of the desirability of moving uh, on, on a joint approach I agree with, the, with what Spick said in the previous session, namely that the region between the Himalayas and however far west you want to go is emerging into such a state of chaos that, the, uh, that it needs some reordering. I'm not saying the United States alone can reorder it. In fact, this is an area where sooner or later 
we are going to be driven. And they are going to be driven. And every other country in the region, India is going to be driven. To, uh, but the, uh, to come up with some concept, or <coughs> it will become more and more uh, chaotic. Uh, it's in this sense that uh, the respect for American thinking in Beijing not in the sense, I do not, of, of a military attack on the international system. I think that is nearly inconceivable. To me, anyway. Let me just ask you about uh, North Korea and China's relationship with North Korea. Do we, are they being helpful to us? Uh, what should we be doing that we're not doing? What would we like for them to do that they're not doing? In, in order to understand their position on North Korea, one has to recall what I said earlier about the uh, Korean War, which is, in Chinese consciousness, a, uh, a, a big event. Uh, no, they are not helpful to us if we mean are they helpful to us in getting the nuclear weapons away from North Korea? Uh, they are marginally helpful, but they face this dilemma. Uh, as in a way do we, which is that the only successful thing the Korean regime has done in its long and unattractive history is to build nuclear weapons. <laughs> uh, almost everything else domestically has been a catastrophe. Therefore, the Chinese probably recognize that the pressure required to get nuclear weapons away from North Korea is almost identical with pressures needed to collapse the North Korean regime. Uh, if one could create a North Korean regime that operates like the Tang reform system and that gives up nuclear weapons and that uh, develops its economy, uh, I think the Chinese would be delighted. Uh, but such a regime wouldn't be the current North Korean regime. And so, I believe at some point there has to be an understanding between China and the United States and other countries on, on a Northeast Asia arrangement into which North Korea fits. And of course, South Korea has to be an uh, integral part of this so that the nuclear question can be solved without chaos in North Korea what the Chinese fear is chaos in North Korea. They have to know that the nuclear weapons in North Korea are infinitely more dangerous to them than to us. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we have not yet found the right way to talk to the Chinese about this, nor have they found the right way to talk to us about it, because there are too many inhibitions on both sides. But it seems to me, I mean, and I, I mean, think you hit the nail right on the head there, and, and I think that's what causes a lot of Americans to just, just wonder about this answer. They don't seem to be as worried about nuclear weapons in North Korea or in Iran, for example, as no. we are. And They're are they or are they not? I mean. Uh, they, uh, they don't have. the cosmic view on proliferation that we have. I agree with the administration that the proliferation of nuclear weapons is one of the gravest dangers that the world faces. Uh, the Chinese look at it more from a local strategic point of view. I've described the Korean issue on Iran. They, they went along with us on the last uh, sanctions. Uh, if we can segment it into individual steps, 
like many governments, they, they do not want to give up the access to Iranian oil, and they are balancing it. They are balancing it. Uh, but in the long run, uh, they will face the question. They'll have to face the question of a chaotic uh, Middle Eastern region. But it would be a big change in their historic approach. Obviously, they're playing a larger role in the Middle East. But let me say one other oh, thing. Go ahead. They sorry. will not do it. When I talk to people here, uh, in, in Washington, they always say they are not helpful to us. Uh, they do not conceive foreign policy in terms of being helpful to us. They, <laughs> they conceive foreign policy in terms of their own strategy. So what we have to t learn to do is to merge our strategy and their strategy so that it leads to, to, uh, to common results. When we said they should be stakeholders, we decide the thing and they make a contribution in that country. They have to be made part of the design. Yeah, just while we're in the Middle East, uh, do you expect China to continue to play more of a role in the Middle East than, than they have in the yes, past? Yes, I think China is going to be forced to play more of, of a because role. Because of the oil, mostly. Yes, and when, when, the crisis, when the crisis occurred in Egypt and the way the Saudis interpreted it. I thought it was almost inevitable that a new relationship would begin with uh, with Saudi. But they're doing it primarily to protect their energy resources. But it is a vital area for them. They'd prefer it if we took care of the security. I thought one of the most uh, interesting. Uh, thoughts uh, in your book. I, you say that American exceptionalism is missionary. Uh, Chinese exceptionalism is cultural. Just talk about that a little. Uh, of course, again, I have to tell you, I do not pretend to be a Chinese scholar. And there are several former speechwriters of mine sitting around here who are moving their lips. Well, you probably know enough to fool <laughs> us. <laughs> so, so with these qualifications, let me make my... Uh, Americans believe that our values are universally valid and can be applied by anybody, uh, by any society. Uh, and moreover, that we can teach any society to adopt these values. And finally, that the prospects of peace are enhanced if we accomplish this task. Uh, the Chinese believe in the superiority of their culture, the uniqueness of their culture, and they are the delighted and proud if you respect it. But there's no way you can become a Chinese. Uh, it is not a, if you are not part of the Chinese culture and born into the Chinese culture, uh, you cannot become one. So I, it's hard to imagine Chinese armies intervening somewhere to make Chinese culture the gov or ch Chinese governing principles, that is not a Chinese way of thinking. The Chinese way of thinking is that the majesty of the Chinese conduct and the achievements of Chinese society will inspire respect which leads to a cooperative action. But it's not one that they have historically attempted to bring about by military force. They'll use military force if they feel themselves threatened and ruthlessly. Uh, but it's hard for me to visualize a Chinese military strategy designed to back up 
a Chinese world government, uh, even in the name of universal peace. So you talked in the beginning about how you know, we have to look for things uh, that we can agree on and all of that. Do you, do you think the two sides recognize how dangerous a rivalry between China and the United States could become? Or do you think that, could, that poses a you danger? You know, what I think, uh, first of all, I think the best thing that was done at the beginning of the relationship was not just the discovery of the importance of the relationship, because that was sort of going to happen, even though we may have uh, uh, done it uh, uh, fast. The best thing was that we, uh, that we sort of put aside all the technical issues that had impeded previous discussions and said, let's talk about fundamentals. What are we really trying to do? And luckily, since there had been no diplomatic relations, there was no agenda to impede it. So if you read the transcripts of the first years of conversation, they were almost like college professors discussing. Uh, but it had the advantage that a concept formed. Now, to talk about the current situation, from my knowledge of the both go governments, and having talked to both leaders now for the importance of what I've said is recognized. I, I don't think there is anyone who's saying that it's not important in the government level. There were confrontational people outside. But what tends to happen now, as each government faces more and more problems, is that they make a communique, and then not much happens until the next communique. What is not happening yet fully is the kind of dialogue that enables us to deal with this question of North Korea in its ultimate sense, and of the Middle East in its ultimate sense. That's where the big gap is. It's not uh, that people don't want an understanding. It's that they have not yet found a method or, uh, or even the people to do it. The United States, I mean, this is a one of the questions that uh, some of the folks at uh, CSIS sent along. One of them was, and I thought this was interesting, the United States was historically isolationist and forced a until forced out on the world stage by a series of great wars. Do you, do you see a similar impulse uh, toward the world stage in China now? You've talked a little about this. But well, it isn't that China didn't have wars in its history. It had many wars in its history, but it never had to deal with sovereign state. The notion of sovereignty was unknown in China. They didn't have a foreign ministry until the end of the 19th century. And then the foreign ministry was supposed to deal only with the invading Europeans. Uh, all other things that we consider foreign affairs were assigned to different departments. Uh, uh, so this notion of, uh, of, of a sovereign, uh, of a sovereign, uh, well, not, will it require wars to force China into that? I don't think that because the Chinese are really careful students of foreign policy and of strategy. But they undoubtedly have different interpretations now of their opportunities and of their uh, necessities. Uh, and I would expect that the new administration that is coming into power next 
here in China, will face it, have to face this. The current administration, after going through a, the Hu Jintao administration, after going through a period that could be compared with the uh, 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 elbowing of the Germans before World War I, however, made a turn which the Germans never made, and Dai Bing Kuo, the state counselor in charge of foreign policy, has made a very thoughtful uh, speech, and the theme now that the Chinese also at the Singapore conference have is that of peaceful rise and, uh, and uh, of a cooperative relationship and even of Pacific community. And uh, uh, undoubtedly, there are contrary views in China. And I, in my view, it should be the objective of American policy to enhance the plausibility of the view that wants cooperation. But in, they have to do the same thing. It's needed on both sides. Uh, it would be a unique experience in history. It's not usual, it's not happened before, but it also hasn't been necessary before. And I keep I, saying in this, not keep saying, I say in my last chapter in my book, what would have happened if the European leaders who drifted into war in 1910, in, from the period, say, 1910 to 14, had known what the world would look like in 1919? Would they have done it? In that case, Germany was the principally responsible country. It was not a, here we are, I think, on an equal basis in uh, having to make adjustments. I just want to ask you <coughs> one more question. You've, you've been to China, what, 50 times now since you made that first trip. I just wonder, as you were on that airplane going to China that first time, what did you, what was going through your mind? Did you, you knew this was on the cusp of something grand, no. but did you have any idea it would come out the way it did and, no, and we, we would be here today talking about what's happened since just, then? Just to keep Winston Lord from rushing up on the stage and grabbing <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> he was my principal associate at the time and the, quality of our thought was shown by the fact that he went up to the pilot seat while I was resting in the rear of the plane so that he could say he was the first to be. <laughs> <laughs> in China, which will show you the, uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, I think that we knew it was a momentous event. Uh, we did not know its magnitude. We looked at it primarily in terms of uh, three things, of balancing the Soviet Union, isolating North Vietnam, and giving the American people a demonstration that even in the middle of a divisive war, its government could come up with a comprehensive notion of peace. None of us, certainly not I, uh, expected a China of the magnitude that has since arisen, and even after we saw it. But it was, we were all lucky in the sense, uh, how often in life do you get a chance to do something unique? Uh, and something that you know is going to make a huge difference. If our mission had failed, it also would have made a huge difference. <laughs> but the odds were that it, uh, that it would, would succeed. And just to show the Chinese style, they had sent a team of people that had uh, to escort us from 
packaged uh, uh, into uh, Indochina, which we didn't know until we got to, to Pakistan. So we knew from them on the plane that this was not going to be a confrontational meeting if it, uh, if it was avoidable. No, it was a, it was from that point of view a, a uh, great experience. But we had others, uh, I would say, one great moment was when we knew the Vietnam War would end and that didn't end so we thought it was a great achievement, mm -hmm. and that failed, and that blew up. But we knew it would do, make a historic change. But a number of things we couldn't imagine, uh, it predict. For example, we thought that there was a possibility, and all our experts had told us, that if we moved towards China, relations with the Soviet Union would deteriorate, and we thought we would get into a period of increased tension with the Soviet Union. The exact opposite happened. The opening to China greatly improved our relations with the Soviet Union, and in fact made it possible to have a global policy of uh, what was then called uh, uh, invidiously detente, but which we thought represented some significant problem. Dr. Henry Kissinger.